Hi everyone, this is two-time World Poker Tour champion Jonathan Little, and I want to tell you about my training site, PokerCoaching.com. Poker Coaching is the place to be if you want to increase your poker skills and learn to crush the games. It's the only place to quickly increase your win rate with active learning, so you can achieve your full poker potential without having to hire an expensive coach. Right now, podcast listeners can score a free membership by visiting pokercoaching.com slash card player and get access to top training tools like our interactive hand quizzes, our 7, 14, and 30-day challenges, and a roster of elite coaches such as Matt Affleck, James Romero, Burt Draftganger Stevens, Michael Acevedo, and dozens of others. Again, that's pokercoaching.com slash card player to get your free membership right now. By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 139. And this is a special edition of the podcast because today we are going to be changing the format just a bit. Uh, As you can see by the title, my guest is tournament director extraordinaire Matt Savage. Matt is a lifer in the poker industry. He got his start as a chip runner and worked his way up the ranks, eventually becoming tournament director for Bay 101 in San Jose, then the World Series of Poker, and ultimately the World Poker Tour where he now serves as executive tour director. Now, Matt's poker stories are definitely a must listen, but diehard fans of this podcast will recognize that we've already done it back in episode number 57, and I recommend everyone go back and check that out. The real reason Matt is back on the show is because along with uh, Linda Johnson, Jan Fisher, and Dave Lamb, Matt is a co-founder of the Tournament Directors Association, or TDA as we know it. The TDA was founded back in 2001 with the goal to standardize the rules of tournament poker from room to room. Before that, uh, it was house rules and they would vary from property to property, resulting in a lot of confusion, which ultimately hindered the growth of the game. If you've played a poker tournament in a licensed casino in the last 20 years, there's a great chance that the event used TDA rules. In fact, as you will hear Matt say in this interview, more than 95% of card rooms follow TDA rules nowadays. Of course, the rules occasionally need to be tweaked or even changed entirely, and that's where the TDA Summit comes in. This July in Las Vegas, the TDA held their 10th meeting with uh, poker room staff from all over the world congregating to talk about the latest industry challenges and issues. This year's summit resulted in a number of rule and policy changes, uh, which tackled subjects like the big blind ante, uh, the order of mixed games, uh, player abuse, stalling, and the use of real-time assistance, or RTAs. And Matt, who sits on the TDA board of directors, has graciously agreed to break it all down for us. So, without further ado, here is my conversation with Matt Savage about the latest from the Tournament Directors Association. I am here with uh, the Executive Tour Director of the World Poker Tour, a perennial Poker Hall of Fame nominee, the star of the movie Lucky You, That's right. a full-time golf and bowling enthusiast, <laughs> and of course, founder of the Tournament Directors Association, or the TDA as we like to call it, Matt Savage. Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing great. 
Good to be uh, here and back in Las Vegas after a long summer of poker. Yeah, yeah. You you were busier this summer than normal, or? Uh, not really. I mean, a little less busy because uh, my golf course is closed, but uh, <laughs> also played a few events and uh, had uh, the TDA Summit to get ready for. And, you know, of course, with all the players in town, uh, lots of questions answered on social media about tournament rules and procedures. How many of those you get a day? Uh, a lot more during the summer, yeah. but at least 10 a day during the summer through text, you know, social media, Twitter, uh, email. It's just constant. events you have nothing to do with. Events I have nothing to do with. I take the blame <laughs> for when something goes wrong. Uh, and sometimes I get the credit for things that uh, I'm not even involved with, too. So that's, you know, that's the good and the bad. All right. Well, we're here today to discuss not you. If people want to hear about you, they can go back three years ago to the podcast we did uh, where we discussed your start and the Bay Area and how you eventually took over the series and then the World Poker Tour, blah, blah, blah. You could catch all of that in that episode. I highly recommend it. Today, we're going to talk about the TDA Summit that happened just about a month ago here in Las Vegas. Now, before we do that, what is the TDA and when did it start? Tournament Directors Association started in 2001, and uh, it was the idea I had to... I was playing a lot of events in the Bay Area. I came to Las Vegas in 2001 with the you know, idea of starting something that would standardize the rules of poker. And so I went into the World Series of Poker, and I spoke to the TD at the time, whose name was Bob Thompson and his son Robert Thompson. And basically they kind of, you know, just, you know, didn't think that it had any legs, that it would never be able to be done. And luckily, uh, Linda Johnson had this thing called the World Poker Industry Conference. And so I was friends with her, and I asked her about doing something with that. And she said, sure, let's do it. So uh, the TDA never happens without Linda Johnson and uh, Jan Fisher and Dave Lamb, who are the initial four founders of the, the TDA. Um, basically, we all met in a small little room at the Orleans Casino on the tail end of the World Poker Industry Conference. And there was 25 uh, card room managers, tournament directors from around the, the country. And now it's grown into, you know, I think 5,000 is the membership with poker dealers, players, uh, industry people, card room managers, tournament directors, and just a bunch of different people that care a lot about the game. So what did poker look like before the TDA? Was it just a, a madhouse of crazy? You just had to walk in and read the rules on the wall? Definitely rules were different everywhere you went. Uh, and, you know, those type of things cost people money. When people don't understand what the rules are and a mistake is made, it literally could cost them the tournament. So uh, the fact that tournament rules are now consistent due to the TDA, and you can go anywhere basically around the world and say, are you using t TDA rules? And if you are, I understand what the rules are. And they will say yes, and there are some exceptions from time to time. But for the most part, everybody has the standardized rules, and that all came, in my opinion, from the TDA. So what percentage of card rooms use the TDA? I would say high 90s uh for sure uh around town everybody uses tda except for the orleans and apparently they've got some new management and they will be going to the tda soon as well so i'm excited about that you know we i really appreciate that people that care about the game want things to be the same for all the players uh, when they go from venue to venue event to event so i think it's very important uh it's good for the players it's good for the industry and i think the tda has accomplished that Okay, so when did the summit start, and how does that work? The first summit was, uh, well, I mean, the first meeting we had was in 2001. first summit we had was probably in 2007, and basically it's uh, our group, uh, which includes now Mike Bishop, who is kind of the uh, the heart behind the whole thing. He's uh, the guy that, uh, that I met out of Chicago, just came, volunteered his time, and now basically handles the forum, handles the website, and when we send out the invites and all those things, he's a big part of that. So, you know, basically we reach out through social media, invite players, tournament directors, uh, and, you know, all of the new ideas and things that are coming up uh, through poker throughout the years. Uh, we took a couple years off because of COVID, but we're back. And uh, it's just the things that are the hot button issues that are coming up. And can we make a rule about it? Will we make a rule about it? And that's basically what the TDA started with. We, you know, the way we do things is we basically put something up for a vote. If we can get a 90 to 85 to 90% majority in the room, we'll try and push that other 10, 15% over and say, can they live with it? If they can live with it, we will make it a rule or procedure. And then for us, it makes it easy because then we just ship that out to everybody that's in the TDA and say, everybody in the room agreed to this. Uh, we think you should do the same. Yeah. 
And uh, if you have an issue with it, you can explain why. And uh, if you don't, then I think we should do that just for the benefit of the players. Okay. So when you go into a summit, do you already have kind of an order of business to discuss? Or is it kind of like an open call to anybody to bring up any issue they they want yeah in the past we would always gone over all the rules and you know seen if there's any issues any tweaks any wording needs to be changed stuff like that and we still do some of that but uh for the most part we will you know i'll send out a bunch of different inquiries through different platforms this the the forum the social media i think is there anything that's really bothering anybody and if it is we'll bring it up and say is there any way we can fix this any way we can make this a standardized thing and if we can like i said we'll make that into a rule or procedure and, uh, you know, then people are, you know, we call to the forum, we call to the, the live stream. Is there anything out there that people really think needs to be fixed? And if so, can we fix it? And uh, that's basically how it works. All right. Well, let's go over the 2022 changes and suggestions. Uh, the result of this latest summit, the 10th summit all time, I believe. Yes. Uh, the biggest one that stood out to me was a rule to combat stalling. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I'm sure that was probably everyone's biggest <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah, it is everybody's biggest issue. And it's, you know, there's a couple different uh, camps on that there. You know, there's some players uh, that feel like, uh, hey, they're putting up their money. They should have as much time as they want. There are others that feel like uh, stalling and slow play, you know, basically kills their uh, excitement and, and fun of the game. Uh, I'm more in that side. I think that, you know, there's a, definitely a time and a place for people to take as much time as they need, but I also believe that there is a time and a place where <clears throat> people need to play the game faster. And I think most of that comes, you know, before pre-flop and people that are constantly stalling the game or holding up the game, I think are really a, a detriment to what we have. Uh, and it kills the, the joy of the game for a lot of people, especially the recreational and amateur players. And those are the people that I'm always looking out for first. Yeah, it seems like this problem is not happening as much today at the highest stakes games as it was at one point. And it, but it is still obviously a big issue in just mid to, to low stakes games. Was this an issue bef back in the day before the poker boom? No, not really. It, you know, I think it really developed on TV, the World Poker Tour, the World Series of Poker back in the day when you would see these, these final tables. And people would see, you know, a lot of time being taken. Now, remember, when you're putting those on TV, these are the late stages of the tournament. They're the final tables where that right. type of thing should be more prevalent. But it's not. It's where people see these things and then they start doing it from hand one and it becomes a real issue. Yeah. It slows the game down. It ruins the structure. It does a lot of different things that are bad for the game. And I think that uh, that's how it all developed and started. Uh, you know, with people playing online as much as they were, everybody had a clock. So people should be used to playing with a clock if they're coming from the online world. So why is there not one in the live world? Right. So what is this new rule change and how, how are card rooms going to start combating this? Uh, it's not necessarily a rule change. It's just that we have asked um, the floor staff and other players to police it better. I think that uh, one of the things that we've done in the past is is we've added a rule that says that a floorman can actually call the clock on a table. In the past, it had to be done by another player. And I think that people are more respectful of other players' times, and I think that other people are, uh, you know, cognizant of what's going to happen if they take too much time, that the floor can say something. Um, that doesn't mean that it still doesn't happen. There's still definitely a lot of players out there that uh, stall, play slow, and of course, with bubble situations and money jumps and things like that, it has become more prevalent. And, you know, you see this online, you see this in live tournaments where people are stalling. So a lot of different procedures have come up. Paul Campbell uses one he calls soft hand for hand, where he just watches and makes sure that one table is not playing ahead or uh, many more hands than others. Uh, I've always in the past, you know, had some kind of level of communication with the players and let them know that they need to play faster in these times. And, um, you know, same, that it's really ruining, Marshall and golf would do. exactly <laughs> it's just ruining the structure uh, and it's ruining the pleasure of the game for other people. And so it's just something that I we really uh, were uh, strong about people keeping an eye on it because I think it it became a little bit loose. Look at there's you know, in poker, there's been a lot of uh, turnover you know, through the COVID uh, pandemic. There's a lot of people that left the industry. A lot of new people coming into the industry don't understand that, uh, 
it's become much more difficult to get people to staff these things. So, you know, there's not as many floor staff on the floor. So people are taking advantage of that. I think it's a real issue. Yeah. I'll, that being said, I'm all in favor of giving tournament directors more leeway with making judgment calls. Right. Seems like there was a lot of by the book rulings back in the day, but I feel like you guys know what you're doing and you can make the fairest call in the in the moment. Yeah, and a lot of that is TDA is that, you know, I am perfectly comfortable going to a table and not giving a penalty where it may say in the rules that a penalty needs to be given because I understand the situation. Just like, you know, exposing your cards for action is complete. Is that a rule that needs to be given 100% penalty 100% of the time? No, right. it's not. Did it affect action? Is it something that could potentially, you know, cause somebody to lose more chips or save chips? And that respect, I think a penalty is warranted. If it does, I think that even though it was a mistake, you need to make sure that people don't do this in the future. So, you know, it's those type of situations or rulings that I'm comfortable making. But I'm not comfortable with everybody across the nation and across the world making those same type of rulings. That's why their rulings might be a little more strict than what maybe what I would give. So you need to have some leeway. You need to have some understanding of what it is. But again, right. with all of these new floor staff coming into the game, you have to have something for them to fall back on. If they need to make a ruling that may be a little more strict than I would make, they have something to fall back on with the TDA. Well, in that way, like tournament directors basically just become another, you know, element of that room that you have to account for. Right. Everyone's going to have their favorites, the ones that are the most fair or whatever. Uh, and if your room suffers from a bad TD, people will stop frequenting it. And same as any card room manager, you know. Right, and I, we do hear that from time to time. Some floor staff are just way too strict. They're not, uh, you know, maybe as friendly as they're used to or something like that. I think it's something that needs to be, you know, uh, I guess respect needs to be earned over time. So, you know, a lot of these new people that are in this industry have a passion for the game. I love to see it. And so, you know, training and things like that need to be done a little bit better, I believe. Um, but we'll get there. You also made it a point to talk about making the game more welcoming to women. Definitely. I think it's something that's been needed for a long time. Uh, uh, it's always come up every year it comes up. And, you know, this year was a little, I, I, I won't say that it was, um, it wasn't, it was just like, oh, we're going to talk about this again, Got it. which to me uh, is unfortunate. I know there's a lot of uh, different uh, women's groups out there now that are doing a lot of different things to, you know, make the game better for women to play. I am full support of all of that, uh, ladies events, all of those things that have have come up over time. I still think we need to do more. And I don't know what that more is. I mean, if we could just get the number up from four to five percent to 10, 20 percent. Wow, that'd be a massive uh, jump in, in growth of the game. So uh, what can we do to make that better? Of course, uh, having women feel safe when they come in or not have to take abuse from uh, verbally from other players that uh, are also at the table is a big part of that. Um, I've always been really strict on that. If anybody's out of line in that situation, you know, I'm very strict to go to the table and say, hey, look, you know, if, if you do this again, you'll be out of here. So uh, I've had not as many issues as I've seen, you know, maybe reported to me over time, but uh, definitely some changes need to be made. So the, the game is more inviting, not only for women, but for everybody. Let's also talk about uh, the no phones at the table. Why isn't that a rule? Um, it's not a rule because it just can't be. The, the year we're living Didn't in 2022, it, used to be a rule? it was a rule back in the day. <laughs> and that was early on, right? Early yeah. on when when the flip phones were first started coming out, people were saying, you know, we can't have these tape, these phones at the table because it could grow into this huge, big issue. And it did. Yeah. What if and it text somebody under the table? Exactly. Or whatever? That was the, the preliminary uh, concern of everybody. Right. That people would just blatantly text each other their cards. You yes. Know? <laughs> and, you know, there's still some theory that this could be happening with the headphones, with the Google Glass, with the Ray-Bans, with the, the speakers in them. All these different things, you know, are things that, are troubling to me it's things we need to look out for for the future with the charts at the table that was a big issue you know were people being allowed to use charts should they be able to use them during the hand should they be able to use them at the table should they be able to use them between hands all of these things are incredibly tough to police and again 
we don't have the staff across the board that can just sit there and monitor every single table, every single player, every single hand. So it's one of those things that we talked about. We said we need to be more vigilant about it. But in the end, really nothing we can do about it, um, you know, right away. In two years, will this conversation come up again at the next summit? Yes, it will. Right. As technology changes, there might eventually come a time where we can't have it at the table anymore. Absolutely. It could definitely happen. So let's, you brought up these charts. Uh, there were a few viral treat, uh, tweets this summer where players were caught uh, st- openly staring at charts on their phone while at the table. And there was a large group of people who said that should be perfectly fine as long as they're not in a hand. Uh, the TDA has basically come to the conclusion that n- no charts at the table, right? Even in between hands? No, that's not true. We came up, you could not be using a chart during a hand. Okay. So that's actually the rule. So in between hands, you can still pull it up on your phone. Yeah, so only because we can't stop it. Got it. And, uh, you know, a couple people in the audience said, why don't we just pass out charts to, to everybody, you know, so <laughs> that they have them or give a website and let everybody know so everybody's on the same footing. And, you know, a lot of people say that if somebody's using a chart, between a hand and you see them using it you kind of know how they're going to play so that might affect the way you play so it's it's something that i don't think can be stopped um it came up uh with basically a tweet from uh, a, one player taking a picture of somebody else using a chart that in itself where people were saying should somebody be able to take a picture of you of right. your phone of your another cell phone <laughs> and it was a whole another issue altogether um and i think in the end there's nothing much we can do about it except to make sure that people aren't using those phones or those charts during a hand. Personally, where do you stand? I stand, uh, you know, I've come back and forth because I don't feel like there's anything we can really do about it. Should phones be turned face up during a hand or should they be forced to be turned down during a hand? Again, you got people watching movies, you got people watching videos, <laughs> you got people watching sports, you got people doing all of those things all of the time. So I think. As TDs, as dealers, as people, other players at the table, it needs to be more self-policed. And, uh, you know, poker has always been a game that needed to be self-policed. It's not like there's somebody watching your table at all time, even though the dealer should be. They've got a lot of other things going on, too. So it's important to me that, you know, people that are playing the game are doing some self-policing their, of their own. Yeah, I guess it's a whole can of worms when you consider the fact that even if you were to ban it in between hands of the table, what's to stop them from walking away from the table or looking on a break or any, or I mean, when are you allowed to st- stop studying? <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, with the live streams and people, you know, we talked about it and brought it up. But this, again, when you talk about televised events, live streamed events, people say, well, you can't have them doing this on the breaks and learning and, you know, what I'm doing from before. And I always say, well, you know, that is such a small percentage of the poker that's played around the world that we really couldn't create a rule for the TDA that covered all of those things. And of course, you know, people are going to do it. People are going to learn and study. uh, And I think it's almost an advantage to those. If you want to change your play, you know that these guys are all over there studying their charts and studying, you know, the hands that you played before. Change it up. Yeah, you know exactly what range they're going to be shoving with if they're playing optimally. So Exactly. Change it up if you need to. Yep. All right. Uh, one of the more interesting ones I saw in here was the recommendation to change the order of games for, for stud and stud eight. Yes. Are you saying we shouldn't play horse anymore? I think horse is uh, will still be played. It will still be played, but it's going to be played in a different order. So you don't have to play with Hold'em, Omaha, stud, Raz, and then mm. eight or better. So what we did, what we wanted to do was to break up stud and stud eight or better because those two games are both low card bring-ins and those are where the majority of the mistakes happen. Now, the, the funny thing was, is that a lot of people said to me, we like when people make mistakes. And to me, <laughs> I'm on the other side of that. I'm not going for that. They, they liked it because people made mistakes all right. the time. Right, it could be argued that it is a skill set to pay attention. Correct. Right, and you're hurting the people who have that skill set, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yes. They're saying if, uh, yeah, if that's some kind of advantage to you because you're paying attention every time <laughs> that you should be able to take that advantage but i'm i'm opposed to that i think if we could do something to change it let's do it let's make it so that it's not the same for everybody that everybody can uh you know 
know that those two games are not going to come back to back. So if you're playing Raz, of course, you're opening with the high card. So you're opening with the low card the following hand. You know that the game has changed. And to me, uh, that's an angle I don't want anybody to exploit. And of course, you know, that game is played by the majority of people that are my age or older. <laughs> so therefore, you know, I'm always out to protect those people as we well. We have to help out the elderly. Exactly. Uh, well, we can't call it horse. We can't call it shore even. Um, sure. We're talking heroes. Sure. Oh, heroes. Okay, yeah. let me do that one. H e r o s. Heroes. I'd like that better than sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the big blind ante. Okay. Right. Um, what happened there? So big blind ante is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Everybody seems to agree. There are a few people that th- say that it affects you know the game and that it should go back to individual ante, but. Really, for the speed of the game, for the dealers, for the players uh, that weren't paying attention, because, again, <laughs> phones and all of those things, this is just the best way to know. You know that if you're missing an ante, you know who's missing the ante. You don't ever have those rulings anymore either because of this. So it's here to stay. Now, the problem is, is there's some different little technicalities in the rule. Uh, one being, is should the big blind come first or should the ante come first when the players are all in? Uh, we could never get a full agreement on that. And this is coming up a lot more in high stakes games where people are betting all but one chip all of a sudden. Exactly, because it's a strategy, mm-hmm. you know, and it's something that people are exploiting because it's it's something that you know that if you have one chip left, you can still win the whole ante and come back in this tournament. So people are using that, and that I'm fine with that. I have no problem with it. The, the issue was that when people were getting into that big blind and – does the ante come first or does the big blind come first? Some people stuck with uh, the way it should be, where the ante's first. <laughs> and some people... Well, that would don't. make sense Latin uh, speaking. Yes, right? exactly, because <laughs> ante means before. So, yes, it's supposed to come before. But even those players that say that, yes, it's technically, technically correct, it's bad for... Uh, newer players, amateur players who don't understand why it should become come first. And that if they happen to go almost broke on the hand before the big blind, the next hand, they can't win the full amount that they think that they should be able to win. And so I was willing to change. I, I stuck my hand up. I said, I'm willing to go back to big blind first because only because I want everybody to do it the same way. No other reason. I don't feel that that's correct. I don't feel it's the right way that we should do it, but I was willing to change my own feeling about it just so we can get everybody to agree upon it. And I've changed things in the past where I thought it was better the other way, but if everybody agreed it was better one way, then let's do it that way. So basically I said, there's 50% that want one way and 50% want another way. Let's just take it out of the rules. We struck it from the the TDA. So basically it's up to each individual card. Each individual card. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I stand on that. I've never been in that situation. I, I mean, as, as as a short stack, I would want to win more than just my own ante back. That's right. for sure. <laughs> and that's the one of my problems is people trying to protect short stacks. Why are we trying to protect short stacks? There we go. Yeah, they des- I think they deserve it the their opposite. Troubles. We should be trying to protect the big stacks and people that earn that big stack. So, you know, it is what it is. I don't think uh, we're going to come to an agreement. Hopefully, we'll try for it again in a couple of years and see what happens. Yeah, we'll see where the consensus goes there. Um, a few hypotheticals for you here. Um, actually, let's let's talk about the the play halting on shorter handed tables. Yes, because this was an issue that some people were complaining about, and it also happens a lot in like nightlies around town, right. where maybe there's not a lot of staff and they're not really watching or paying attention. Sure. Um, so what's the situation there? Situation is in the past it would always be that if you had a nine handed tournament and one table got to six. Well, first of all, players, when you get to seven, people are always, hey, floor, floor, we're too short. Blah, blah. <laughs> give me well, a player. Yeah, give me a player. Which, <laughs> okay, it's fine. We don't need to do that. Nine and seven is fine early in the tournament. We agree that that's okay to play those those two different scenarios. Especially if registration is still open. If registration is <laughs> still open. Later in the tournament, we talked about if you were down to a certain number of tables, and we couldn't come up to an agreement. I've always done with six, so I balance within two if – uh, where six tables or less. But a lot of people don't run those big tournaments. So when do you start to balance and when do you start to move people from a nine to a seven? Uh, that was one thing we talked about. And I think that once you get to a small amount of tables, I think it should be a responsible thing for the floor staff to do that. But I think, again, six tables for me was a number. Of, some people said three, um, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is when you're nine and six, should you instantly stop, not deal any more hands? And we came to the agreement that as long as it's not affecting the blinds, the big blind, 
Got you're it. not going to stop. So if the big blind isn't the next hand, we're not going to move that player. They'll, again, deal another hand because what happens in these scenarios a lot of times is that you as a floor staff will go to the next table of nine. You'll sit there and wait while their hand is going on. Now they lose a player. Now you got to go to the next table. So this table is sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And, you know, I want people to be playing poker. Right. So this way they can at least play until the big blind hits an empty seat. Yes. And when that hits the empty seat, now we know that we're going to move that player to that seat. And so they're coming from the big blind to the big blind. It's more equitable for everybody across those situations. That way you don't have people waiting. Again, they can deal one more hand. And this is going to be a training exercise for all TDs around the world to get, you know, the floor staff to do that because they're used to doing it in one way. And then, you know, that's another thing that the TDA has to deal with all the time, that if we make a major change, uh, there is another major change that we are making that uh, you have to wait. You have to wait until everybody understands it, everybody's using it. Hey, that's the new TDA rule. And people that, you know, are really in tune with what we're doing at the TDA are on top of it. They're waiting for that new rule to come out so they can make that change. And I think that, you know, it's one of those things that we're going to be working on training for everybody. Miss deals. So it used to be, let's say the button gets a third card, you just pull it back, right? Right. Put it back on top of the deck. Keep going. Is that not a thing anymore? <laughs> the button gets a third card? Oh, or not the button. Or I guess small, small blind. blind. Yeah, small blind get a third card. Yeah. I mean, if it can be corrected, we don't want to have missed deals. Missed deals obviously slow down the game. Uh, it makes it, you know, so the, the the dealer feels worse about it. If we can correct a missed deal, we will. If we can't correct it, then we, again, will missed deal it. Uh, situations have come up. The one with the joker gets dealt out, put on the flop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we want to treat that like actually the, happened, guys. Yes, it actually <laughs> happened. The a joker came out on the flop. I do not want to miss deal that hand. I want, you know, what the way they made that ruling was they said it was a dead hand and everybody got their money back. Whereas I would just go to the next card, take it out, uh, similar to what we call the scrap of paper rule, where it's a, you know, um, a, I forgot what's called, I can think of what it is, where you just take this card out of play mm -hmm. and go to the next card. And so that's the way I want to handle this situation. I want to make it so there's as few misdeals as possible. I'm never into chopping pots for a mistake like that. Um, if action has taken place, I think the hand should play out. Right, but you wouldn't reshuffle the deck either in this spot. You no, take, not in that spot. Just take it out and put out. the next card right on the flop. Right. Yep. As opposed to, let's say, an early card. As opposed to, let's say, somebody had a joker in their hand. Oh, okay. Then we would take it and make it a misdeal. What if the dealer is uh, burning and turning too fast before action is complete? What, what change there? Okay, so this is another big change and another one that has been around forever. On, you know, And basically, on day one of the summit, we came up with a question. Listen, if somebody burns and turns too early on the turn card, do we want to take back all the cards and shuffle them at that point and then put out the turn and the river? Or... Do we want to continue to do what we've always done mm. and put the river card on the turn? Because that would have been the, uh, the That would have been. River. And this is all goes back to random card theory. Mm -hmm. And then put the, the river card on the turn and then put the uh, shuffle back up and then burn and put out a river card. I said, this is nonsense. We've been doing this forever. <laughs> We're talking about random order. Should the order be 100% random? Or what happens when you burn and turn too early on the flop, what happens? Yeah. Julio? What happens? You get a new flop. You get a new flop. They shuffle it back <laughs> up. What happens on the river? If you turn the river, you to, get a new river. You shuffle it up and you put out a new river. That's right. It's only Why on are we one street? not doing it on the turn? And so what <laughs> happened was I woke up at six o'clock in the morning on day two of the summit. I go, look, we do it this way on the flop. We do it this way on the river. Why are we doing something on the turn? This is more consistent. It's better. It makes more sense. Do it the same way. I think it All goes three back streets. to old school gambler superstition, right? They want yes. their they want their original river that they were going to get, right? Um, and man. the other scenario is that this actually gives that exposed card two shots to come back instead of one. And the other way, it only had one shot to come back. This way, it has two shots of coming back on the flop. Therefore, it's better. There Therefore, go. we changed it. Therefore, everybody that uses TDA rules should do it this way. I like that one. That one's a good one. Yeah. All right. A um, couple hypotheticals here this summer the poker integrity council made its debut uh does this council affect the tda in any way and did the tda ever consider something similar yeah we've talked about it in the past and we've talked about hey 
this guy uh, cheated online or this guy, you know, got barred from this casino for getting in a fight. Should now, uh, should that player be barred from your casino? Should that player be not able to play in your casino? And to be honest, the TDA can't regulate that. I cannot tell you that because you did something at uh, the Aria, you can't play at the win because maybe the win doesn't know about it. Maybe the win doesn't uh, have the same policy on that same situation this player got eliminated from. It's one of those things that I don't think that the TDA should be involved in because it's not, um, it's not easy to do this type of thing. There could actually be lawsuits. Somebody said, I didn't do anything in your property. I did not break any rules at your property. Why, why would I be not allowed to play at yours? Now, Blackjack has a book, right? Why can't we do something like that for poker? It's been talked about multiple times at the TDA for over the last few years. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of these situations are he said, she said. The people that are apparently allegedly accused of cheating online, that information's not even being uh, distributed by those online sites. They're not even stopping them from playing on another online site. So how can we, as a uh, land-based casino, right. say somebody cannot play in our casino because of something they've done online? Not to mention, you're only talking about tournaments as opposed to cash game exactly. infractions. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting how this council is going to shake out. I mean, you could have a hypothetical Mike Postle situation where uh, where somebody is 100% guilty in the eyes of everyone who knows poker, but because a jury of our peers don't know don't, don't know anything about the game, uh, now they're vindicated, and now that person could bring a lawsuit, right? Saying, I don't care if you guys think I'm guilty, and it's a lot of that is stuff is literally because if I'm poker stars. I run the event. Okay. I have all the dealers. I hire all the staff. I, uh, got the license so I can restrict you from doing that. But if I'm with the world poker tour, I'm not allowed to say Julio can't play at uh, the win because, um, because we all know we're the world poker tour. Yes. (laughs) Because we're the world poker tour. We're not in charge of that license. You're not in charge of the win. There you go. It's not in charge of the win. We're not in charge of the Bellagio. We're not in charge of the casinos that are our partner properties. They have to make that decision. Now, if they make that decision uh, on their own or through the Integrity Council, we support it. But so could we, you ban somebody from the tour? We cannot ban anybody from the tour. Wow, it's basically because it's, tour. It's, not, it's, a, it's not our property that we're holding these events at. If it was our property holding the event, hiring, staffing, doing all those things, getting the license, then we could. But as of now, that's not the way it works. Another topic in the news is guarantees. Does the TDA have anything to say about guaranteeing events and whether a casino should do, honor their guarantees? Well, we definitely feel like uh, a tournament should honor their guarantees. And again, it goes back to the whole argument about the people saying that the TDA should come up with a standard structure, a standard payout, standard rake uh, formats. All those things would be nice if the TDA yeah. could come up with those things. But I, again, do not run your property. So if you need to charge more for an event or if you need to have a structure a certain way, the TDA could not go in there and say, you need to change this because it's not TDA approved. If we did, the TDA would fall apart Mm -hmm. because, you know, people have other reasons for doing these type of things. Now, on the guarantee issue, of course, we support that fact that people honor their guarantees. But there are certain situations, natural disasters, things like that, that if we said, you can't be on the TDA if you don't follow through with the guarantee. What happened that we had a hurricane? We couldn't do it. And then right. people would say, well, why aren't you uh, condemning this casino versus this one that did it just because they weren't going to make it? So it's not something that we can say that uh, is a part of the TDA. But in the end, it's really bad for the casino that does this type of thing. It's really bad for the industry. And, you know, people that now have less, less confidence in going to that casino. They have less confidence in going to a tournament that has a guarantee because they know that can be pulled from underneath them. And there is language in these uh, structure sheets that say they can do this type of thing mm-hmm. also. So you just have to pick the place that you want to go to that you know is not going to do these Again, types of things. Again, you got to vote with your wallet. you got to vote with your wallet. And, of course, uh, you know, they may have made the guarantee anyway. 
<laughs> I mean, it's the that's the whole thing. We just never know, right? That's the thing. Like, I, I feel like there would have been some crazy FOMO if they had just ran it, and people right. would have gotten in their cars and driven overnight to get there. Exactly. All right, a few more questions, and I'll let you go here. Uh, is there anything that wasn't finalized or passed at this summit that was close? Um, or did it get kicked, kicked the can down the road for a few more years? Not, not really. I mean, at this point in the TDA, we've reached a stage where we've got a lot of the fine-tuning done. Um, would we have been able to push something about not having charts or at the table? Maybe. That was one of the things that was close. Um, but, again, the, the issue of the cell phones comes back. So there was nothing that was really, um, I think, out of line or anything that was, that was happening in the industry that we could do it. And we're never going to get any kind of standard ruling on clocks because people, you know, some people want them, some people don't want them, some people don't want to use them for their staff, some people don't have the technology available to them with the, uh, you know, the cost of, of these type of things. Um, so there's nothing on that. But, uh, you know, another issue that came up was uh, color changes and chips, and we hear that all the time. The media, you guys in the media love to have big stacks on the table. No. It's, hard, it's harder to count. It's harder to count. I agree. It's harder it's to a, count. I mean, let's, well, I guess there's some that the photographers love the big yes. chip stacks. I mean, that looks good on camera. I won't lie about it. But as a chip counter, occasionally I'd like you to keep them in twenties. Okay. <laughs> I'd like you to keep them limited. Right. We came up with a little stronger Mercier language. Rule, right? Yeah, the Jason Mercy rule. We came up with a little stronger language on that to make sure the people are keeping them in twenties. But again, I get the blame for this <laughs> a lot of times, and the yeah. credit by other tournament directors that say that you know us making color changes makes it easier for the dealers, makes it easier for the other players, uh, and you know we don't have these forty-five minute color changes that happen sometimes in the big events so i think that's you know the positives of it the negatives of it uh there's more change being made and things like that so i think we're going to be looking at that again um i am not the guy that wants to change down to you know one or two chips but i am the guy that wants you know to have a player have less than a rack of chips i think you don't need any more than that and uh, i think it does slow down the game i always said a rack is the ideal amount five stacks or less Exactly, and I'm in that camp, and some people. Easy to move I'm getting tables. the blame from other people, from Donnie Remco, Tim Duckworth. People yeah. think I want it down to the the nub, but I don't. They uh, I'm they have a you, TV really. show to make. They have a TV show to make. They have different uh, criteria than I do. Exactly. Um, now, personally, is there anything that you just aren't a fan of in the rules that, if you had your way, you could change? Wow. Yeah, if I had my way, I would uh, definitely think the clocks should be shorter pre-flop uh i would like stronger language on on people that are constant uh stallers um it was we had a a video by a guy named james chen who's a big uh high roller player says that stalling is cheating i don't want to go that far i know it's part of the game um but i guess stronger language on 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 stalling i think would be something that i'd be for um not really. I mean, I think uh, over the years, I've pretty much got every rule in there that I like. <laughs> Hate to say it, but I think that, uh, you know, I would love to see less multiple reentry. I would love to see shorter registration times. Um, it's something that I, because I have some control over that on the World Poker Tour, uh, try to reel in people on some of those things. Uh, we're doing more festivals on the World Poker Tour, so I want to make sure that we have more mixed games in the game in the series and festivals because I think that's a big part of poker, and I think that's a good way to grow the game as well. So those are the type of things that I'm after now. I'm more after those type of things. I want to make the game fun. I've always thought that keeping the game fun uh, and inclusive is where we need to go, and I think less policing is probably better than more. Yeah. Everyone loves poker for their rules, right? Yeah. That's why we all show up. (laughs) Not exactly. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your time. You got it. Anytime. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to Matt for taking the time out to spread the good word of the TDA. I think uh, maybe we'll make it a biennial thing every summer as the summit rolls through town. Of course, if you have a poker rules question, Matt is dying to hear it. You can find him at all hours of the day on Twitter at Savage Poker. You should also go back and check out his episode of Poker Stories, which included some great stories about his work with Robert Duvall on the set of Lucky You, and uh, what he was doing during the infamous moneymaker Farha Bluff at the 2003 World Series of Poker. 
That is episode number 57, which came out in April of 2019. You can find that and all the other 139 episodes of Poker Stories in the archives available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Twitter at Card Player Media. And if you like the show, please subscribe. If you really like the show, please consider leaving a five-star rating and review. Then let us know you did so with an email to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening.